I'm Dr. Lauren Gerson, Senior Associate Editor for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, and today I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Peter Cotton, who's a professor of medicine at MUSC. Regarding his article that's coming out in Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, which is a long-term study looking at his uh, cohort called EPISOD, E-P-I-S-O-D, which essentially was a randomized control trial looking at sphincterotomy versus sham therapy for patients with sphincter odi dysfunction. So first of all, Dr. Cotton, congratulations for tackling this quite challenging group of patients. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, as you know, SOD, sphincter odi dysfunction, traditionally has been divided into three groups, uh, of which SOD3 is a type of patient who uh, has had their gallbladder out but still having a lot of pain, um, but on investigation, uh, nothing is found. So they have normal looking bile duct, and, and no elevation of enzymes to suggest obstruction. And these patients have, uh, in recent years, frequently undergone ERCP with or without sphincter manometry uh, with sphincterotomy. And the literature would suggest that at least half of the patients actually benefit, uh, in some studies claiming 75% benefit. My practice uh, increasingly comprised these patients as people in the community realized that they were actually kind of dangerous. Um, the pancreatitis rate after ERCP in those sorts of patients can be as high as 15, 20, even 30 percent in some series. And so I was seeing more and more of these patients and I, become, I became more and more concerned that I wasn't really convinced that the potential benefits were worth the risks. So we got NIH funding um, starting almost 10 years ago now and as you said did a, a sham controlled study in which Half the patients got a sphincterotomy, and the other half just got an ERCP with manometry, but no sphincterotomy. We published the results at one year um, in the Journal of the American Medical Association three years ago. And at that time, uh, surprisingly, we found that the sham treated patients did just as well as those that had a sphincterotomy. In fact, numerically better, but not statistically better. And so we were uh, fortunate enough to get funding to follow these patients for five years and we recently completed that study and submitted it to GIE for publication. And the results are very similar uh, insofar as uh, at five years, we didn't, weren't able to follow up the whole 214 patients, but we followed 103 for five years. The results are very similar, um, that the sham treated patients actually did somewhat better than the sphincterotomy treated patients. That was based on a, a pain burden score that we developed, uh, which was quite strict. And uh, people have suggested that it was too strict and that we should look at other outcomes. So in the, in the, in the follow-up study, we added something called the PGIC, which is the patient's global impression of change, which is basically asking the patients, as a result of your treatment, do you feel the same, worse, slightly worse, slightly better, much better, or much, much better uh, at a very basic scale. And on that scale, we found that, in fact, a statistically significant benefit for the sham arm. Something like 73% of the people in the sham arm said they were much better or very much better as a result of the no treatment. Although they yeah. didn't know they hadn't had any treatment because it was, they were all blinded. They had no idea. So uh, this really means that this SOD3 thing um, is gone. Uh, the patients exist. Uh, they certainly exist. They're genuine. They're not crazy, as some people have suggested. Um, some of them have irritable bowel syndrome and other GI disorders. But uh, when we looked at the psychopathology, we found that they were no different to the general population. And so it's a challenge to know what to do with these patients now. So what are you using to try to treat them with? Well, fortunately, I don't see patients anymore, <laughs> but my colleagues are struggling with that. And obviously, um, uh, using neuromodulators is, is, is the, the most common practice. It's very difficult to persuade patients that they don't have this thing they read about, particularly if they, you know, if they come back. My colleagues now at MUAC tell me that they see patients who say, Dr. Cotton cured me three years ago, now my pain's back. Difficult to tell them that I didn't have a disease at all in the first place. Um, now, a lot of these <laughs> patients undergo cholecystectomy because they have a biliary dyskinesia syndrome, right. which as you know is quite debatable in terms of emptying of the gallbladder. So yeah. in retrospect, the question is, was the cholecystectomy indicated in the first right. place? Yes, exactly. Um, 
More than half of the patients in the episode study had had their gallbladder out for no stones, for either, either proven dysfunction, as it were, on a, on a hydra scan, or, or even a normal one. And so uh, it, it's extraordinary to find that something like 20% of the gallbladders are taken out in the United States for dysfunction, uh, whereas it doesn't exist in other countries, or it's very, very, very rarely diagnosed. So that's my, that's my next target. I have a, an NIH application in to fund a, a, a very careful study. I wanted to do a, a sham control study of cholecystectomy against a laparoscopy and look around, but the panel really couldn't swallow that. They, particularly the surgeons on the panel said it was unethical, impossible, and unnecessary, and so we're actually going to, into a strict cohort study uh, initially. Uh, may, may end up with a sham control study. So and what we're uh, trying traditionally, to, these yeah. patients undergo manometry, you know, mm -hmm. you know, which is a burdensome procedure. It can also cause pancreatitis. So, what are your conclusions about doing manometry in these patients? Well, in the, in in our cohort, uh, we did manometry in all of them, and it didn't predict the result at all. So it was useless. The literature sort of suggests that manometry is useful in the SOD type two patients, the ones who have some abnormal elevation of enzymes or a dilated bile duct. But I'm skeptical about that, I really am, and I think it's time we reviewed that. I know that most of the expert centers in the United States have stopped doing it. Uh, my, the people at MUIC, very experienced, stopped doing it completely. And I know that the sales of manometry catheters have plummeted in the last five years. Uh, so we've got to find some other non-invasive way of, of looking for dysfunction. Dynamic uh, MR scanning may be the way, the traditional uh, biliary Im dynamic biliary imaging has uh, never, never been very convincing to me, although some people still swear by it. Sooner or later, we'll, we'll get some better in non-invasive procedures. But the problem is that these patients are basically healthy, and, and you have a bad complication. That's, that's really bad news. And these patients, as you know, are suffering from pain and they want help immediately. Mm -hmm. How difficult was it actually to randomize these patients to a sham arm? Surprisingly easy. 80% uh, of the people we asked uh, accepted. Mm -hmm. I, I was re really surprised. We did actually uh, randomize two to one, so two, two sphincterotomy to one sham, which, I th which we did because we thought it would be more acceptable. But um, yeah, I was surprised. Uh, that was, I was gratified that that worked. I will say that despite the fact that all of these procedures done in seven expert centers in the United States by experts without trainees, um, uh, using pancreatic stents uh, to try and reduce the risk of pancreatitis, pancreatitis rate was 15%. Uh, so that's in expert hands. Uh, you've, got to, you've really got to find some benefit before you inflict that on patients. Are there any other points from this study that you wanted to mention? Well, the, to me, the big dilemma is that so many of these people were very happy despite having had no active intervention. So it's, it's a placebo effect. I thought naively that a placebo, whether it was a pill or whatever, would probably work for a few months until, until it sort of wore off, but that's not the case. And the literature is full of studies showing sham, sham surgery, for instance, the results lasting for years. So it's a whole new area that's very confusing to me. And how long do you think that effect is when you study these patients? I mean, is it now out to 10 years or? I really don't know. We have no plans to go beyond the five years, um, but, but the, the effect is persistent. Some people have criticized our study in that the sham arm um, involved uh, cannulating the sphincter and to do manometry because we thought we needed to do the manometry and said, well, maybe you did something to the sphincter by just cannulating it and leaving a stent in for two weeks. But I wouldn't have thought that effect would have lasted for five years. Uh, it would be nice if we'd had a sort of no, no touch arm, but we, we didn't because we wanted to do, get the manometry data. Uh, well, thanks very much, Dr. Cotton, for your explanation of this very interesting study, and we look mm -hmm. forward to more research from your group in the future. Thank you.